lower your head. My head? Good color, splendid blending, nice lines. What do you think you're looking at? The Statue of Liberty at sunset? I never answer questions. It saves time. I suppose I had to answer your question about how this started. I'd have to say there are 202 ways of starting a fire with a match alone, and 17 different ways of lighting a match. Ordinary people do that. Careless people do that. Indians rub two sticks together just for something to do until some tourist comes along with a lighter they can borrow. Oh, partly. We have a cigarette? No, thanks. Leaving so soon? Yes, it's time. I learned very early in life not to engage in conversation with handsome strangers. Now, King Gambrinus had the right idea. He was an old 15th century firegoer, too. Never missed a blaze. But he sensed a crying need after the fires. And one night, seated in his palace, deep in thought, he summoned his magicians, and they brewed a magic potion, sealed it in heavy casks, and chilled it in deep, dark cellars. And when this magic potion had reached its potency, what do you think they had? Beer. Correct. And there's a little place around the corner where this magic potion may be purchased at a price. Have a beer? No, thanks. Oh, that's too bad. Nice cold beer is very nice after a hot fire. How about some food? Thanks, no. A little stroll through the park, maybe? No, thank you. Well, there's hardly anything else I can offer you without getting personal. You seem to think I was born yesterday. Let me see. What was yesterday? Sure you won't have a beer? Some other time. Some other place and some other drink, I hope. And some other girl. Excelsior Paper Box Company's claim has been settled for $130,000. Gentlemen, the situation is appalling. Six big fires in as many weeks, representing a total loss to this company of $1,872,961. And 94 cents. Mr. Grayson, you've had charge of these cases. I'm under the impression that an investigator is supposed to produce results. What, if anything, have you got to suggest? Gentlemen, we have some new and important evidence. I've incorporated it in my report. Your report tells us no more than the daily papers. Not as much. We don't want reports. We want results. I think I can promise you results. One of our advertising booklets was mailed back to us anonymously. It's obviously the work of a pyromaniac. Arson! Arson! Every time you investigators get up a tree, you cry firebug. Better get Tom Fletcher back, boys. So you can see for yourself. Commercial Kemmerer Company. Deutsch Paintworks. Bristow Shipyards. Eureka Linoleum Company. Commonwealth Storage Warehouse. Excelsior Paper Box Factory. They're all here. When? That word, when, sounds ominous. Terrible. Six fires already, and more threatened. The biggest campaign of crime ever aimed at a fire insurance company. Well, that's some kind of a record. Better get Tom Fletcher back, boys. He's the best insurance investigator in the country. Digby's right. Fletcher's record in arson cases is unbeatable. And so are some of his other records. The last case he worked on cost us over $20,000. And saved you 100000 Grayson, go get Fletcher. Sure, get him back. Yes, let's have a talk with him anyway. Go ahead. Uh, 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 teacher's bank. You know my rule, sobriety test before every drink. Marie? She sells seashells by the she sort. Oh, too bad. <laughs> Nancy? <laughs> well, here I come, ready or not. Peter Potter pecked a pink of peckful peppers. Oh, oh, and I've only had one. How sad, how utterly pathetic. <laughs> Hello, Tommy. Hello, John. Children, meet John Grayson. How do you do? How have you, how you been? A moot question, but this happens to be one of my moments. Will you join us? No, no, thanks. I'm here on business. You picked a bad time, John. I'm in conference. And now, Sally, slowly and carefully, I dread the thought of drinking alone. Six sleek and supple salmon slapped on a platter for supper. Success! <laughs> <laughs> Your vacation's about over. You're going back to work. Really? Where? In Roshani. John, you slander me. Mm -hmm. The board of directors is a little perturbed about this epidemic of fires. Oh, yes, I read the papers. 
it would seem that someone was indulging in a little home cooking. Something like that. Mm. What shall I tell them? You may tell that august body, the Board of Directors of Interoceanic, that Thomas Ignatius Fletcher presents his compliments and tells them to go jump in the lake. I think you can write your own ticket. They're pretty anxious to have you back. John, that touches me deeply, but not deeply enough. They gave me a raw deal. And now's your chance to even the score. I think they're ready to eat the well-known humble pie. Peter Potter, Peter Potter, Peter Potter, Peter Potter, Peter Quiet! John, in some strange way, that idea appeals to me. I shall honor them with my presence and feed them heaping portions of humble pie while I munch casually on caviar. At their expense, of course. Jasper, my tabs, please. Not oh, oh, no, no, Tom. Sorry, girls, but duty calls. Oh, that's all. John, we are now on company business. So list these as miscellaneous on the expense account. And don't stint, for Jasper is a friend indeed. Hurry back, Tommy. I'm sorry, gentlemen. But when you're sick, you don't care whether you like the doctor or not. You just call him in. And Fletcher's the man that can cure us. Oh, he's hopeless. Certainly he is. He's an unreasonable, unspeakable, irresponsible, disrespectful clown. Mr. Fletcher always spoke well of you, gentlemen. Glad to see me, laughing boy. Ah, my old friend Digby. I suppose you're responsible for bringing me back to this chamber of horrors. Not me. I didn't want you back. Fletcher, here's what we're up against. Please, I know what you're up against. I know what you want, and I know just how much it's going to cost you. I don't like the sound of that. Gentlemen, the meeting will please come to order. Looking around me, I see the same old faces. I'm not very encouraged by that, for it seems that any change would be an improvement. However, if by any chance I do accept the generous offer you gentlemen are about to make, I want several changes made in the terms and conditions of my employment. I will name them in the order of their importance. First, I want an electric refrigerator put in my office, and it must be well filled at all times. Mr. Grayson will tell you my favorite brand. Then there's that little matter of the secretary. You know the type, not too young, not too old. One who will be decorative for the office. Of course, she won't have much work to do. And for transportation, I'll need a car and a chauffeur. Any kind of a car will do, as long as it's a Rolls Royce. A father's girl couldn't ask for more. I'm sorry, gentlemen, I thought you sent for an arson investigator. I didn't know you wanted a father's girl. However, I would recommend that statuesque blonde, the third from the left in the second act finale. Hold on, let's get on to Casey. Come on, Fletcher, stick a pin in yourself and let all the hot air out at once. Any other demands? Well, just a few minor details. Of course, my old salary must be doubled. Then there's that little matter of the bonus. What bonus? The bonus. For catching your pyromaniac. My idea is a modest little sum, say $100,000. What? Do you think we're crazy? Do we have to go into that? What do you say we call the whole thing off and go for a swim? Last one, then, is a... You know what. Stop the clowning and go to work. All right, Fletcher. It's a deal. Agreed. Send the contract over to me later. I'll be in conference at the Biltmore Bar. A plain case of blackmail. I wouldn't want to be quoted, but I'll bet he started those fires just to get his job back. Good morning, John. Oh, hello, Tom. Your ice box arrived, and it's well stocked. Well, it's a little small. Remind me to tell French to get a large one. Oh, spring cleaning, John? Well, knowing the way interoceanic operates, I'd rather bow out than be kicked out. Nonsense. I realize the fact that in talking me into this job, you talked yourself out. Such honesty of purpose should not go unrewarded. Give me Mr. French, the general manager. Hello? Hello, French. Fletcher. Will you have a desk rolled in here for me? What's the matter? Can't you use Grayson's desk? We're giving him his notice. Sure, there's room for both of us. I said we were letting Grayson go. Agreed, a very valuable man knows all about the case. Now listen, Tom, he's flopped on this thing and flopped badly. Uh, he'd be gratified to hear you say that. I tell you, I'm tying a can to him. Oh, yes, yes, we plan to stick very close together. <laughs> in fact, whether he goes, I goest. Thanks, French, don't forget the desk. Say, if you think you can run this whole... Hello. Operator. 
Mr. Fletcher disconnected. Shall I call him back? Oh, never mind. Uh, just order another desk moved into Grayson's office. The French had no idea of letting you go. Said I needed you around for balance. <laughs> well, if they feel that way, I'd like nothing better than to be with you and see how you do it. Well, John, I plan to keep an eye on your work, too. Mr. Fletcher? Yes? Mr. French said I was to do your secretarial work. Good old French. He also said the job was only temporary. That all depends. Won't you sit down? Now, to get back to this case, just where are we and where are we going? This advertising book ought to be a big help. It has been a big help, but not to us. Young lady, take a letter to the Board of Directors. Copies for every member, please. Gentlemen, allow me to compliment you on your advertising book, and it's a masterpiece. It's a great help to pyromaniacs, arsonists, and firebugs of all kinds. My suggestion is, in the future, any pamphlets going out to the general public be accompanied by a small can of gasoline and a box of matches. Respectfully, yours, Tom Fletcher. Will that be all, Mr. Fletcher? I am optimistic enough to hope that it will not be all. Did you notice that all these fires happened on weekends or holidays? Yes, as though the firebug wanted to make sure not to endanger life. And that would indicate that it was not a general arsonist, but one who has a particular grudge against inter-oceanic. Correct, John. You'll also notice that the fires occurred in the exact order the buildings are listed in this booklet. I discovered that after the second fire. Nice going, John. What did you do about it? Put guards in all the buildings. Yeah, but that didn't stop the fires. No, it didn't. We might just as well have hung a sign out. I can't understand it. They're all good men. John, I want you to call off all the men working on this case. All of them? I'll have my men take over the situation. All right. I do it in person. In person? In person. All right. Oh, in person. Oh, yeah. Stop by the office and get your check. I'll let you know if I need you again. All right, Mr. Grayson. That's all. It's a fire investigator's business to be curious, particularly about people running away from a fire when everyone else is running to it. Well, I'm not running away from the fire, Gambrinus. Oh, hello. I didn't know it was you. I was just going around the night street to get a better look. They wouldn't let me through the lines. But you make that all very simple. Do I? Certainly. The police won't stop me if I'm with you, will they? We'll soon find out. Hop in. In the Oceanic, the lady's with us. All right. John, you play host. I'll see you in a little while. My name's John Grayson. I'm Fletcher's assistant. My name's Mott, Nadia and Mott. How do you do? How do you do? Maybe we can see better over here. Thanks. Finding a back there. Doesn't look so good. Well, Tony, what did you find out? Plenty, boss. I stay around the building all the day. Everybody she come home. You know, get a half a holiday. Make a bigger fiesta. You never mind that. Anybody come out later? Well, two people. So one a little fella. He's much scared. And then a big fella comes out, a fancy guy. He looks off, he looks it down, then he goes away. You think you could find him in the crowd? 
<laughs> One is a catch already. Over there? Josephine, she pointed him out. Josephine is my G-man. Come on, Josephine, show Mr. Flesh. Go away, man. Take it away. Some fire, huh? Yeah. Interested in fires? I ought to be interested in this one. Why? That's my factory burning up. Oh, then you must be Mr. Crane. If it interests you, I am. And if it interests you, I'm the investigator of the Interoceanic. I'd like to ask you a few questions. Tell me something about this, Mr. Fletcher. Well, he's the best fire investigator in the world. That's an odd sort of fame, isn't it? Yes, in a way. I've heard a lot of people say that if he weren't an arsonist at heart, he wouldn't be such a fine investigator. You mean set a thief to catch a thief? <laughs> yeah, something like that. <laughs> he must be very clever. Tell me some more about him. Well, thanks very much, Mr. Crane. I'll call on you later. Young lady, when the Honorable Tommy passes into the great beyond, half the girls in town will be out shopping for morning outfits. Well, John, showing you all the fine points of firefighting? I've been learning everything a young girl should know. Oh, well particularly about investigators. Oh, very nice. Building me up so I'll have further to fall. Well, she wanted your biography. Oh, but the best chapters are yet to be written. Oh, I know something about your history. Your friendship with that noble monarch, King Gambrinus, and that little place around the corner where his magic potion may be purchased at a price. Shall we have a beer? Some other time. Some other place? Some other drink. And some other girl? Some other girl won't do. <laughs> you know, I'm disappointed in you. Not only as a Prince Charming, but as a fireman. No good detective wastes his time in whining and darning when he should be working. She should be on our board of directors. <laughs> oh, but really, I've been working very hard on the most interesting case. And what might that be? You. Me? <laughs> but why are you so curious? The National Correspondence School of Detectives always taught me to be curious of stray beauties. Well, the young lady's 24. She's lived in France for the past five years. And she's an orphan with no mother to guide her. Doesn't that suggest possibilities? And now that that's settled, why don't you get busy and tell us who started those fires? Well, it's too soon. You can't figure things out ahead of time. Well, if I were working, I'd have some suspects. Ah, but I have my suspects already. You have? Mm-hmm. Everyone in here. Plus the board of directors, plus the minor employees of Interoceanic, plus John Grayson. Me? <laughs> But uh, I haven't any motive. Give you one and you're in a perfect spot. Working on the case, knowing what's being done, one jump ahead of yourself. Plus Tom Fletcher too, then. My motive? To return to a very important and lucrative position within the Oceanic. And that fat bonus. John, your powers of deduction are marvelous. Let's make it unanimous. How about little orphan Annie here? Me? Well, you're always at fires. Even caught you running away from one. If I was smart, I'd have you in the calaboose right now. And my motive? When Thomas Ignatius Fletcher detects a woman's motive for anything, he'll walk right up to a statue of Sherlock Holmes and say, move over. <laughs> I'll drink to that, Tom. And after that, gentlemen, I think I shall say good night. You wanted to get into this investigation, Tom, so I'll see Miss Martin, home. Miss Miles, how do you weigh, old man? Not at all. I don't mind a bit. It's a pleasure. Pleasure? Well, it's an honor. <laughs> there seems to be some dispute here. <laughs> Absolutely. Get our things, Tom, please. There's only one way to settle it. Call it. Uh, let me. Tails. Heads. Heads. Sorry, John. Make yourself at home. You'll find a good book in the icebox. A penny for your thoughts. They're not for sale. Two pennies. I was just thinking, that's the first serious thing you've said to me since we've met. Well, that even is gone. Now, shall we start all over again? Then just be ourselves? Yes. <laughs> all right. You know, you must hate me. On the contrary. Why should I? For taking up so much of your time when you should be working. Well, frankly, there's nothing for me to do. I mean, 
about the fire. Oh, you can't find out anything about a fire while it's blazing. It's like a love affair. You mean you never really understand it while it's flaming? It just happens. And later on? When it dies down? You find the reason for it in the ashes. Hey, there it is, down there under that pipe. Now, don't touch it with your hands. Pick it up with your axe. Hello, bad news. Hello, Chief. Let me have that box, too. Boys told me you were around. I thought Interoceanic had sent you out to pasture. They did. But I pined for you so much, they brought me back. To do what? Stick a handful of ashes under a microscope and stop all these fires? You haven't been doing so well lately. If I didn't know it, I could trust you to remind me of it. You're down to the office early today, aren't you? Hello. I thought I'd find you poking around in the ashes. What brings you down to the ash heap? I came for two reasons. One, to get my car. Oh, and the other? I have a complex. I want to be a fireman. Don't tell me your mother was frightened by a fire horse. <laughs> Take off your hat. This is a very solemn occasion. Put your left hand in the fire plug. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to learn to play pinochle dress in 10 seconds, slide down the pole, hang on to the hook and ladder, break into windows, flood the cellar with water, when the fire's in the attic, sound the siren, ring the bell, and chop up pianos with axes as all false alarms? I do. Then you're a farmer. In that case, I'll go right to work. What have you got there? Souvenir. I get one at every fire. Mr. Fletcher speaking. Under no condition, ring this phone until you get further instructions from me. Good morning, Mr. Fletcher. Good morning. And who might you be? I'm your new secretary. What happened to the old secretary? Oh, she got transferred to another apartment. Another what? Oh, I said apartment, but I meant department. Sometimes it's all the same thing, though, isn't it? I suppose you know what your duties are. Take I'm the supposed... wire off wine bottles. Now, don't tell me it's lovely work if you can get it. Oh, Whitey. Better start opening one right now. I don't think how you stand it. I could never take a thing this early in the morning except orange juice. I don't like oranges. I don't like strawberries. Do they give you a rash? Mr. Fletcher, after all, you ain't my doctor. By the way, did Mr. French tell you that this job was only temporary? Yes, he told me that. Good old French. Gentlemen, the Acme fire was started by a man who might easily have been miles away from the scene. By remote control, I suppose. Exactly. All he did was to make a telephone call. Hello, Pat Chief. Is such a thing possible? I've been a fireman for 32 years. And I've yet to see anyone start a fire by sticking a nickel in a slot and saying hello. Of all the fantastic stories. If you gentlemen will pardon me while I make a phone call, I'll try and convince you of my statement. What am I to do with this? Mr. Fletcher speaking. Connect me with the board of directors room. What's he talking about? Hello? What is it? What's the matter? What's happening? Get some water. Get some water. Well, what are you waiting for, Chief? Somebody to ring a bell? Stand aside, man. I've got it. Nice going, Chief. And that, gentlemen, is how the Acme fire was started. Sit down, sit down, fan yourselves, boys. Mulligan's got everything under control. Your fires were started by a firebug who posed as a telephone repairman. In every single case, he has shown up the day before the fire, gotten into the building, tinkered with the telephone equipment, and hooked up a chemical charge that exploded when he called the number back on Saturday or Sunday when there was no one there to answer. Why didn't it explode when other calls came in? Oh, he blocked that by telling the operator that the phone was temporarily out of order, and he hooked it up on a direct line. And now what happens, mastermind? 
All the other companies that we insure have been notified to watch for a man who comes in to fix the phones. And the next time he shows up, we'll grab him with the goods. Before the fire starts. Exactly. Is that clear, gentlemen? I think so. Now all we have to do is to keep our mouths shut. A tough assignment. Very clever trick. Yeah, I handle my fires very well. Oh, I'd love to see it. It sounds better than a show. It was a show. The phone rang, and from then on, it was like a farce. You should have seen those directors hop. <laughs> Were they surprised? I mean, when he proved to them that it was a phone call that started the fire? Were they? Their mouths opened so wide they could have swallowed baseballs, and Mulligan was the funniest. <laughs> Tom Fletcher is clever, isn't he? To figure that out from a tiny clue. Well, I did the detail work on it. My congratulations to you, too, then. <laughs> well, where did we get our man? Did they get a description? Of the man? No, he was seen changing the phone, but nobody paid much attention to him. I'm betting on Tom Fletcher, though. And you, too, of course. Say, how about forgetting Tom Fletcher for a while and having dinner with me? We'll run up into the country. I'm awfully sorry, John, but I can't. Another date? Yes, and one I can't very well break. Would you if you could? I think I would. Personal column, please. Yes, ma'am. That's 56 cents a line for one day only. And a special four-day rate at 48 cents. Four days. Thank you. Good morning, Noah. Good morning, sir. Uh, we're having a guest for breakfast, a young lady. She ought to be ringing the doorbell at any moment. Yes, I see. Well, she mustn't see our picture gallery. Oh. You've taken down the photograph of Miss Wilson, Miss Dale, Miss Moore, and Miss Broderick. Yes, sir. All gone. Fine. I put it away. A young lady, she... she's most unusual, Noah, but she has faults. Her nose turns up too sharply, her eyes in the wrong shade of blue, and sometimes in a serious moment, she seems a little cloudy in the belfry. Well, I don't know. There's something about her. But with all those faults, you still invite her over to Sunday breakfast. Well, well, you got here early, didn't you? Your powers of deduction are marvelous. I feel very flattered to be leading the field. No, why didn't you tell me that Miss Martin was here? Oh, tried to very hard, sir. You talk too fast. That's what I said. You shouldn't creep up on people like that. It's a habit you must break yourself of. I'll try very hard. Mmm, strawberries and champagne. And very good, too. It's an old family custom, started by my great, 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 great grandfather. Give. Mmm. I hate to admit it, sir, but you're a master dunker. Mm. I shall carry the memory of this luscious treat with me forever. Dunking is a noble custom, my good lady. It quickens the eyes, steadies the hand, pleases the palate, and greatly improves the flavor of the strawberry. But suppose this insidious fruit were to mark me. Ah, a strawberry mark on your pretty shoulder, and you'd be the missing princess of Jorgenstein, with a Balkan kingdom waiting. Sorry, I don't care for some. I've seen the Balkan. Oh, you've been around, haven't you? I'm Adrian of the Adriatic. Leave me with my secret. By the way, just what is your secret? Are you always this disagreeable at breakfast? Oh, no. Some mornings I don't eat breakfast at all. I want to ask you just one question. Remember, you don't have to answer. That's what I said. Some place in your dark and shrouded past, there ain't been no wedding bells. Has there, little gal? No, chief. Nary a tinkle. That's all I wanted to hear, darling. Because there ain't been none in mine either. And it's high time. There go your wedding bells now. That's why I call it the irritator. Something's coming up. Sorry, Noah. Where is it? 
Wall left and west. Madison Litwitz Company. Right on schedule, too. That's my reputation going up in smoke. Oh, here. Take this badge and go where you like. I've got a little work to do. Oh, now, Molly, don't feel so badly about it. Tell me what happened. Oh, Mr. Fletcher, I'm that distressed with it. I'll take my sacred oath that no person, telephone man, or anyone else went in that building since it's closed. Was there anyone at all around here last night? It being Saturday, there was a straggler or two, no more. Then a few came and went to the garage. Then there was an old duck in a long overcoat. A man? On me oath, I couldn't say. The coat came to the ankles. Struck me funny wearing an overcoat at this time of year. Yeah. Much like a skylight now. Give me a glove. Come on, boys, put some water on that stuff. Let's get a look at things. That's my glove. Hey, you've got another one. Sure, but I got two hands. You'll need them if you ever take up the saxophone. One of the finest glasses for its purpose. Concentrated light and electrotherapy. Thinnest magnifying glass ever made. Who manufactures it? Nobody now. The Maxwell Glass Company used to make it, but their factory's gone out of business. Who owned the factory? An inventor named Maxwell. Fred Maxwell and his wife. She was a very fine chemist. Are they still here? That I couldn't tell you. Much obliged. Send your bill to my office. Oh, I'll do that all right. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Miss Appleby. Your story interests me. Proceed. I'm your new secretary. Oh, what happened to the old one? Mr. French is planning to give you a new secretary every three or four days. Good old French. Miss Appleby, can you open a bottle of wine? I've never tried. I disapprove of the use of stimulants in any manner, shape, shape or, or form. I know. Miss Appleby, take a letter, please. <clears throat> to Mr. French, the general manager. Esteemed sir, in the future, please don't reach so far down into the bottom of the barrel. Will that be all? I'm optimistic enough to hope that it will be all. And that, gentlemen, is how the Madison fire started. Here, Chief, put this out, will you? They removed a pane of glass from the skylight and substituted a piece of optical glass. They placed it at such an angle so that the sun's rays would hit it about 11.30, and you'll see what happened. The goods, which had been chemically treated, were ignited. Did it take you a whole week to find that out? No, but it took me six days and nights in the laboratory to find out what this was. A non-evaporating chemical, which bursts into flames. Did you discover the formula? I did. But it goes to the archives of the Department of Justice in Washington tonight. Seems that you boys talk too much. Explain that remark, please. Gladly. We're the only ones who know about the telephone hookup. That bit of knowledge leaked out and warned the firebug to change his methods. Well, what's the next step, then? Frankly, I don't know. 
First time I ever heard you say that. I'm sort of on a blind trail. The company that made this glass went out of business seven or eight years ago. The Maxwell Glass and Instrument Company, owned by Fred Maxwell. I remember that company. Well, you ought to. You broke it. We refused Maxwell alone on your advice. Oh, yes, I remember now. We got a bad report on him, and he swore to get revenge. And it wound up in a big shoot against one of our other companies. I think I recall that case. Yeah. Don't strain yourselves, lads. You remember enough. Come on, Johnny. We've got a little knitting to do. The rest of you are dismissed. School's out. Better dig into the files on that Maxwell case. Get what you can on it and bring it to my apartment tonight. All right, I'll get right on it. See you around 7. Say, Tom, there's something you ought to know. Yeah, all right, far away. Well, somebody else knew about that telephone setup. I uh, accidentally talked about it myself. To whom? Adrian. Adrian? How did you happen to do that? Well, to be perfectly frank with you, Tommy, I, I've grown pretty fond of her. We were having a drink together, and I, I told her more as a joke than anything else. It's foolish of me, I suppose, but she won't let it go any further. We know that. John, when your mouth's closed, you can't put your foot in it. Remember that. You better get to work in that Maxwell case. Miss Martin, latest edition, just out. Thank you, Charles. Back to the barn. Okay, Chief. Well, well. Right. One false alarm right after another. This one ought to be easy for you. All you got to do this time is to find out who started something that didn't happen. Too bad they had to wake you up, Chief. You turn in that alarm? No, I didn't know anything about it until I heard the sirens. Anybody wise to you? No, they think I'm a regular watchman. Keep your eyes open. This false alarm may be something new. I'll be careful, sir. I'll help you across the street. What did you turn in that alarm for? I didn't turn in. It was a woman. A woman? Yeah, I got a license number. Are you sure it was a woman? You think I'm blind? <gasps> insurance company. Where's Miss Martin's car? Uh, right there, beyond the second column. Thanks. I represent an insurance company, madam. Have you given a thought to the future, to your old age? Insurance is not a very pleasant, but it's a very vital subject. You interest me, sir. Won't you step in and show me some of your samples? <laughs> I was in the neighborhood, so I thought I might buy a drink. Well, I'm just uh, having some tea. Will you drink that? Well, if I must, I must. <laughs> <laughs> Working hard? No. There hasn't been a thing doing. Oh, I thought I heard fire engines go by a little while ago. Go by where? The hotel here. What time did you get back? Oh, I haven't been out. As a matter of fact, I was taking a nap, and the engines woke me up. Lemon? 
Thanks. Well, it's probably a little far someplace. Would you like me to call and see? Oh, no, no. If there's anything important, they let me know. Why did you ask me if I'd been out? I thought I saw your car parked in front of the Biltmore. Oh, my car hasn't been out of the garage all day. You think I'd be running around like this? You're a terrible detective. I'm beginning to think so myself. Well, if we're going out tonight, I'd better run along and dress. All right. And I'll try very hard to make myself beautiful. Ah, uh, it wouldn't be hard. <laughs> Thanks for the tea. I hope it doesn't make you sick. No, I've been on a liquid diet for a long time. <laughs> Good evening, Noah. Good evening. Is Fletcher in? Yes, sir. Go right in, please. Come on in here, John. What did you find out about Maxwell? Well, here's the story. Eight years ago, he owned the Maxwell Glass Company. Things got to looking bad. He tried to float loans. The bank turned him down. He'd done a lot of business with Interoceanic, so he came to our board of directors. <laughs> Imagine having to go to a bunch of buzzers like that for anything. He held a million dollar insurance policy. Couldn't he borrow on that? He already had. About a hundred thousand. So, when they turned him down for another hundred thousand, he laughed at them and swore he'd get even. Well, it gets better. Yeah, that's what I thought till I learned he'd committed suicide to make them pay the million. Uh, tough way to get even. But the company didn't pay off. Any lawsuit? Sure, they produced a suicide note. The clothes that were found in the dock, the man who saw him jump overboard. And no corpus delicti. Right. And the company beat the widow and orphans out of another million. How like the boys. Widow and orphan. One daughter named Adeline. And that's as far as I was able to get today. Adeline Maxwell. I guess that's far enough, John. I remember, all this took place seven years ago. I haven't had time to check up on the last six. Yeah, we'll get to that tomorrow. Oh, uh, here, uh, here are two tickets to the music box. A very charming young lady of your acquaintance is waiting to be taken there tonight. Adrian? She's expecting you. Yeah, well, tell her I'm busy. Something sudden. Are you drunk? Not yet. <laughs> well, thanks very much. Say, I'll, I'll have to run along and dress, won't I? Yeah, drop in after the theater. Well, nothing came up all of a sudden he had to take care of, and there's the story in a nutshell. <laughs> very nice, if you like nutshells. But what's he supposed to be doing, looking for the firebox? Ah, uh -huh, young lady. What Fletcher is up to, nobody knows. <laughs> Music box. What's the idea of all that noise? Uh, what's that? Shut that thing off. Yes. I've driven 600 miles today, and I've got to have some sleep. Can't you read that sign? Oh, I'm very sorry, sir. Stay out of this hallway, or I'll complain to the manager. Uh, yes, sir. Now, you see what you've done? You've made me lock myself out. Oh, that's all right. I'll let you in, sir. Got to be careful about this. Uh, yes, sir.
Fletcher into Oceanic. All right, Mr. Fletcher. All right, come on, come on, come on. Somebody hurt? Yes, it was a watchman. Just a moment, Doctor. Hello, Sam. Hello, boss. What happened? I pushed the time clock at eight and blew up in my face. Better not talk anymore. Change my mind. Bring me several drinks. Yes, sir. Good evening, Nella. Good evening, Noah. Good evening. Mr. Fletcher in? Yes, sir. Come in, come in. You know about this? Know all about it, all about it. Sit down and keep very quiet. What in the world are you trying to do, Tom? Play a song. This is a new instrument. I invented myself out of an octave of old champagne. Ah, this is no time to be drunk. You're telling me? But what about the fire? Shh, I told you. No, all about the fire, all about it. I know something you don't know. Come on, Tom, snap out of it. No, 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 she wants to know about fires. You know what happens to little girls who play with fire? They get burned. What happens to little girls who tell lies? What happens? Terrible things. Nobody likes them. Oh, very bad, very bad. I better take Adrian home. No, I'll stay. Mm -hmm. My name is Tommy Fletcher. What's yours? What's your name? Don't be silly. We all know her name. <laughs> That's the funniest thing I ever heard of. We all know her name. I know her name. Funny when people change their names, they always keep the same initial. Adrian Martin. Adeline Maxwell. That's your name, Adeline Maxwell. And I know your father's name. Hey, Tom, what are you trying to do? And I know your mother's name, too. What's behind all this, Tom? Darling, I couldn't start to tell you. Because if I did, there isn't time enough for me to go through. Why do you go to all the fires? You won't tell me? All right, then tell me this. Why won't you tell me? I can't. You don't trust me. How did you happen to know where the fires were going to be? Oh, please. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Why did you turn in that alarm today? Two hours before the fire started. Tell me that. I can't. But I'm your friend. Bless my heart and hope to die on you. Maybe I can help you. Maybe I'm trying to help you. Oh, I know about the whole business. How your mother was cheated and your father was... Tom! Can't you see what you... Shh. It all fits together in little pieces. You tell me. And I'll tell you. Don't you understand? I can't tell you. If you don't tell me now, you'll never want to tell me. Never. But you've got to tell somebody about this sometime. I think I'd better go. No, you can't go. Somebody wait to see you. You Adeline Maxwell? Yes. I place you under arrest on the charge of arson. This is Mr. Cole, the district attorney. We'll go to his office now, if you're ready. I'm ready. Adrian. I'm going with you. John, please keep out of this. Do you realize what you're doing, Fletcher? Imitating a drunk. Imitating? You're as drunk as a fool. No, I'm not. I didn't want her to think I could do a thing like that sober. Well, drunk or sober, it's a terrible thing to do. Listen to me, John. I know who the pyromaniac is. Are you trying to tell me that Adrian... I'll never tell you anything about Adrian that would hurt you, John. Because it would hurt me just as much. Now, I want you to go right out and get on the trail of Mrs. Maxwell, Mrs. Francis Maxwell, widow of Fred J. Maxwell. Check up on every lead and get a good description of her. 
Adrian's mother? Yeah, she's the pyromaniac. Her motive's revenge. The company broke and robbed her and sent her husband to his death. What happens to Adrian? What happens when any mother sees her daughter's in danger? I'm banking on that. She'll come out of hiding to protect Adrian. I'm going back to the office. Get what you can, bring it by there. Oh, John, what did you find out? Plenty. Swell. Did you get a description of the mother? Perfect. When last seen, she weighed 135 pounds, 45 years old, gray hair, brown eyes, five feet tall. Here's a picture. That'll make it easy. I'll have a thousand copies made tomorrow morning. Yeah, that'll be great. We'll crack this case by tomorrow night. What else did you find out? Mrs. Maxwell died eight months ago. What? She's dead. She died before the first fire was ever started. She was buried in France, where they lived. Are you sure? Positive. Aren't you? What do you mean? What are you imitating now, Fletcher? A man who's surprised? You framed that girl. You're wrong about that, Grayson. Anybody ever tell you what a low, unprincipled cad you are? Lots of times, but go ahead if it'll make you feel any better. You crucify your best friend to solve a case. Go on, get it out of your system. All right, Fletcher, here it is. I've worked for you and rooted for you up to tonight. But from now on, I'm against you every foot of the way. Travis Detective Agency, this is Fletcher. I want you to send a man out to shadow John Grayson. Yeah, lives at the Cornell Arms, that's the one. Oh, nothing much. Just got a hunch that he does better imitations than I do. Cope, I want that Maxwell girl sprung. What's the point? The point is I've missed on the case. That's why she won't talk. She knows nothing about it. I made a wrong guess. Go on, tell me some more. Now look, I'll take the rap with the newspaper boys or anybody else. I built the case against that girl deliberately. Out of nothing. Planted the evidence. Framed her. The whole thing's a mistake. But it isn't my mistake. Everybody knows you're stuck on this girl, but be reasonable, Tom. Why, the case is spread all over the front pages. Public opinion demands a trial. Now, if you can go out and convince the voters, who put me in office that the girl is innocent, I'll spring her tomorrow. Can I see her? You know better than that. She's in arson arrest. Held in communicado in the psychopathic ward? That's right. I can't even see her myself until the alienists complete a report on her mental condition. Grayson's been around trying to see her, too. I had to turn him down. Even the newspaper boys can't talk to her. It's only fair to warn you, Cope, that some way or other I'm going to spring that girl. There's only one way that you can spring her, and that's to go out and find me the real pyromaniac. Well, 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 look who's here. I'm just going to send the boys out to find you. Well, Chief, what's on your so-called mind this morning? We policemen may look dumb, but you shouldn't try to pull the oldest gag in the world on us. Look at this. All wrapped up in cellophane. Yeah, he said it, with love and kisses. Tom, love is blind, but the jailers ain't. <laughs> now, here's an apple. All you have to do is pull the stem and inside is a little note. <laughs> it's got whiskers on it, and tried by a man who calls himself smart. Uh -huh. I'm surprised. But listen to this. Hey, I got you into this, and I'll get you out. Love. F. <laughs> Old man remorse. He's been telling me the same thing. You guys are pretty smart, aren't you? Tom, on behalf of the guards at the county jail and the police department, I want to present you with this as a token of our love and affection. And you can either eat it yourself or return it and get your money back. And let this be a lesson to you, Tom. You'll have to hand it to you, Fletcher. You're a good judge of fruit. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sir. Yes, sir. I'll take care of that. Fletcher, you're getting in my hair. It's a good thing I'm not twins. There wouldn't be room enough. That's not funny. Did I ask you? What does this fellow John Harmon look like? Hmm, slender, oldish fellow, about 60. Psychopathic ward? Yeah, and if they ever catch up with you, that's where you'll be. That's what I said. Over here.
way, here's the woman's observation ward. And here's the men's observation ward. And this is a big yard in between with a wire fence running through. You sure? Say, this joint is practically the old homestead to me. And I want to tell you something else, fella. It's the oldest stir in the country. Well, they could sell it to an antique dealer who's got so many wormholes. If a fire broke out, where would it be likely to start? Well, the paint shop would be about the best place. You see, when you're outside having your exercise, you can get into the paint shop there. And above the paint shop is the laundry where they clean the uniforms. Yeah, yeah. You're a sense to start a fire in the paint shop. That'd be about the best place. Give me a cigar, Bob. Certainly. What kind? Five center. Say, a man's following me. Do you know where I can find a policeman? Why, no, I wouldn't know. Well, I'll find one, and when I do, I'll have you arrested for impersonating an officer. Can you tell me where I can find a policeman? What? Woman without an umbrella, across the street. There she was, Fifth Avenue streetcar. John pulled the gun, shot the baby. No ambulance around when he arrived. What do you mean? Well, you dumb flatfoot woman without an umbrella. Johnson Troy shooting fast, 45th Street, Kudo fast. Pulled out the gun, hit the pillow, shot the baby. No ambulance around when the elephant got there. Are you crazy? Crazy! What's going on, Mulcahy? This guy's as crazy as a bed bug. Call the wife. Hello, John. What brings you here? Just wanted to congratulate you. You finally got the right man in jail. Sit down. Tell me that again. Maxwell case. Fletcher's your man, all right. Say, wait a minute, son. You're going too fast for me. Oh, you don't have to cover up with me, Cope. He's in the county jail being held for observation. That's where he belongs. Fletcher? Yeah. How did you find this out? Had him tailed. I suspected him all along. Is that how you figure, John? I certainly. And when the case comes up for trial, I'll be right there to testify. Hello? John Harmon. All right, Al. Get in line. Tiberius Jones. All right, Al. Jones, I want you to go out and sit in the sun for a while. Okay, but don't forget, I gotta fight Max Bear tomorrow night. I've got a bet on it. Time. Frank Olson. All right, Al. I'm tired, old boy. Olson, you're being allowed in the yard for a little exercise. But don't talk to any of the men. Me? Hmm. Talk to them? No, sir. They're all crazy. Looking for someone? No. No, of course not. Well, you're through. Think so, do you? You think so?
I never suspected Maxwell was behind all this. It makes two of us. I have a confession to make, Tom. I suspected you. I'm sorry. Well, why be sorry? I suspected you. Yeah, I know, but I had a detective on your trail. Yeah, I found that out. But you weren't really suspicious, John. I had your phone wire tapped, a dictaphone in your apartment, and three Sherlock's tailing you in eight-hour shifts. <laughs> <laughs> and it was Maxwell all the time. <laughs> all alone and unaided. According to his confession, right, Cope? Well, it's mighty lucky he lived long enough to tell the true story. If he hadn't, the boys would have arranged to make this place your permanent address. Oh. <laughs> we might yet, unless you tell us how you worked it out, Tom. Well, it was easy. After I tumbled to the fact that there was no real proof of Maxwell's suicide seven years ago. Well, but we found a suicide note then, and his clothes. But you didn't find the body. Remember that, Chief. If you ever want to commit suicide, leave the body around so we'll be sure. <laughs> <laughs> but that didn't lead you to look for him in jail. Well, if I must, I suppose I must. Now, step by step, the girl was in jail. She worked twice as hard as we did to stop her father. Even he had a little humanness. He didn't want his daughter to suffer for something he'd done himself. All right, what was his next move? To get her out of jail. How? By getting in. And once in, he used the weapon he knew so well, arson, to create confusion and cover their escape. You didn't pick all that out of the air without a single clue, did you? No, I had a clue. Just one. You handed it to me, all wrapped up in cellophane. You see, F stands for Fletcher, but it also stands for father. F? F? Yeah, that note in the apple. You see, gentlemen, I didn't send that basket of fruit. But you haven't told us where you're going on this extended vacation. Rome. Why Rome? Well, I don't know. I've got a couple of theories to work out. You know, I've got a hunch that Nero played the fiddle to cover up, and it was really he who set fire to Rome. So I'm going to poke around in the ashes. Goodbye. Goodbye, Tom. And the best of everything to you always. And to you, John? Well? Well, what? Just well. And after that brilliant farewell, he exits to the left, and if you don't mind, I'll exit. Where are you going? No. Really? Really. I have a theory of my own. Do you think you'll find the answer? In the ashes? I think I will. <laughs>